Welcome to Gospel Bound, a podcast from the Gospel Coalition for those searching for resolute hope in an anxious age. I'm your host, Colin Hansen, and each week I'm joined by insightful guests to talk about their written work and how the gospel applies to all of life. Together, we keep looking until we see God working. Wherever you're listening, welcome. I'm glad you're here for today's conversation. Proverbs 31 ends with a famous description of the woman who fears the Lord. But did you remember Proverbs 31 starts with an exhortation for men? Proverbs 31 commends men who do justice, men of wisdom, self-control, and courage. In his new book, The Intentional Father, A Practical Guide to Raise Sons of Courage and Character, published by Baker, John Tyson writes, Men who use their energy like this, courageous men, wise men, self-controlled men, just men, These kinds of men are the need of the hour. Foundational values in your son's life may lay the foundation for a renewed society. Well, Tyson's book equips intentional fathers to help their sons reach their redemptive potential. These fathers view their task as a calling from God and raise sons with all their might. He writes, the goal is to help young men fulfill their God-given values of being conformed into the image of Jesus. Well, that is easier said than done at a time when boys grow up learning life should be easy that they're important, life is about them, they should try to control everything, and they can live forever. How do you grow up that way? How do you learn to embrace difficulty, care for others, surrender to a greater cause, and live for eternity? Well, Tyson's book can help. He points us to a God who embraced difficulty with us, who emptied himself, who lived for others, who surrendered to the will of his Father and looked ahead to eternal rewards. John Tyson is a pastor and church planter in New York City. He moved to the United States from Australia more than two decades ago. He joins me on Gospel Bound to discuss The Intentional Father and also his 2020 book, Beautiful Resistance, The Joy of Conviction in a Culture of Compromise, published by Multnomah. Much as he argues for the family in this earlier book, Tyson commends small, thick, communities that will endure for generations amid temptations to compromise. You'll also recognize this common theme from this podcast, Gospel Bound, quoting from Beautiful Resistance here. All great revivals have taken place in times of decline. Resurrection is found among the dead. I want to call you to resist compromise when your friends tell you your faith is too intense, your devotion unnecessary, your life together too much. All right, so I'm eager to talk with John about fatherhood, risk, discipleship, and more. John, thanks for joining me on Gospel Bound. Well, great to chat with you, mate. Thanks for having me on the show. All right, well, John, you define a man this way. You say a man is an image bearer and son of God, entrusted with a power and the responsibility to create, cultivate, care, and defend for God's glory and the good of others. Now, listeners might not know how hard it is in this cultural moment to define manhood. How did you arrive at this definition? I definitely agree. We're living in very complex times where people can't seem to answer the question, what is a man, what is a woman, what is gender, and why is it important? Um, I think I tried to put in there basically just through meditation on what the scriptures teach. And obviously, from the person of Jesus, there's something about being made in the image of God, bearing his image. But what what do we do with that? There seems to be a kind of unique gift of strength uh, attributed to men, particularly in the scriptures. Obviously, women can be strong too, but there's there's something in there that rings true, I think, in men's hearts. And then how do we live that out and see that strength modified through the person of Jesus? So it was basically just like a lot of meditation and trying to to patch uh, some sort of coherent definition together. Now, I love this question. It comes after one of your earlier chapters, and the the book is designed for for group discussion. I would see it working really well in uh, groups of fathers. But you asked a question or pose it to the readers. What are two or three of the top lessons you learned from your dad while you were growing up? One of the things I've said after many attempts, John, to publish on manhood at the Gospel Coalition, only to find that... That is a hard task to do in the internet. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, just, it's harder to do than I thought. And I've, I've often thought, it seems that manhood is easier caught than taught. And your book is really a manual of many ways of how to help your son to catch it uh, from his father. And But I want to turn this around and ask you, what are two, the, two or three of the top lessons you learned from your dad growing up? Well, you, I think you definitely touch on the deep felt need for men to 
um, come to terms with the, the forces uh, that have shaped them, made them who they are. And I definitely agree. It is easier to get men together and process this stuff than it is to write about it in public and talk people into it. There's the, I mean, there's a lot there about what that means that, uh, you know, men struggle to deal with this in public. I think there is deep, deep pain uh, and you're touching the soul on a deep level whenever you start talking about the home and the father. My dad is a good man. My dad is a godly man and uh, he's very, very kind and he's modeled servanthood a lot. If I was to ask what I've learned, ask myself what I've learned most from my dad, number one would be prayer. My father is a man of prayer. So, I mean, that book is dedicated to my father, Ian Tyson, whose prayers have carried me this far. When I was a teenage rebel, uh, wanting nothing to do with faith, God, the church, my father basically went after me. And uh, he would spend significant amount of time praying and fasting and calling me back in the spiritual realm from rebellion. And I know that sounds kind of like dramatic and Pentecostally, but I think it was just the desperate love of a father saying, all my natural mechanisms have run out. So I've learned about the importance of prayer. And uh, I think the other thing I've, I've learned from my dad um, is the need to overcome generational brokenness. My grandfather was a missionary in India. And a man that had a very dynamic and supernatural ministry sharing the gospel saw a lot of remarkable miracles. But he was a terrible father. My father grew up in a boarding school in India, uh, only saw his dad uh, a couple times a year and was deeply, deeply wounded by the giant absence of a father. So my dad did everything in his power not to pass that cycle on. And so I think he had a conscious awareness of how he was raised, and he he did his best to bridge the gaps and give me uh, what was not present in his life. So that desire to sort of draw a line and say, this stops here and let me start a new legacy, something I definitely got from my dad that I tried to carry forward in how I raised my son, Nathan. You make a great point, John, that followers of Jesus have a tremendous advantage in developing young men because we're embedded in rich communities of other men and other families. I was thinking about an earlier guest, Lyman Stone, on Gospel Bound, where he said, one of the ways we're going to have to help people in a post-Christian context to see the truth and the beauty of Christianity is by showing them how it works, the benefits that you enjoy as a Christian. And this, when you said this, I thought, that is amazing. I mean, that's so true. I take that for granted that my sons are just surrounded by other older men and sons, men who are involved fathers, men who care deeply about that. And so help us ex- help us see what was your best advice for how Christian fathers can take advantage of this blessing in in fatherhood? Well, I mean, the, the books, uh, so I want to be clear, the book's called The Intentional Father, Not the Perfect uh, father, this book does not come with promises. It just comes with the nobility of doing something with integrity. The outcome is up to God. I mean, we we know that. I do believe in sowing and reaping, but I I just want to put that disclaimer out there. So, but my answer will be, we do it through intentionality. You know, the the culture we live in is such a blizzard of distractions right now. Um, kids' schedules are their kids are so overscheduled. Um, travel, sports, pressure to get into to high schools, colleges. If a dad's not careful, all he's going to do is um, just go along with the cultural flow. And so that possible benefit is going to be missed out. So it would be intentional. Prioritize gathering with the people of God. Expose your kid to the church as a whole, not just student ministries. Let him have access to that rich community of men and see what it is. Some of the dads in our church right now are doing something beautiful. The dads and the sons get together once a month right now. Talk about an issue impart one specific skill and then each dad and son take a turn sort of modeling this and i thought gosh outside of the the scouts which are not even the boy scouts outside of the scouts where does that happen and again there's very few places where this works i I remember very clearly after uh, hurricane sandy in new york city the city was scrambling to get volunteers and christians were just texting small groups and i remember one of the people who worked for the city saying who are you people and where did you come from and i was like i'd like to introduce you to the body of christ <laughs> this is the christian church we we still have these rich networks of connection so expose your son to it take advantage of it integrate him into it and don't let american culture sort of fragment the opportunity this seems to be related john to that point i liked your this, this progression that you give for fathers starts with i do you watch, we talk, 
Then it goes through a number of different steps to you do and someone else watches. Is there any difference between doing this with your son as a father and doing this with another believer in discipleship, or is it roughly the same thing? I think it is the same thing, but there, there is some kind of, and that's originally from Dave Ferguson, I think, in his book, Exponential. Um, one of the things I think is important to acknowledge is that there is a deep primal ache that we have for our fathers to be present and our fathers to impart things to it. So yeah, the process is the same, but I think the emotional connection and the the spiritual and formational experience is a little bit uh, more potent. And getting that kind of attention is a gift. Getting Having your dad spend that much time with you or even pass that on is its own form of blessing. And so, yeah, it's it's general discipleship. And I guess that this book, in essence, is a book of discipleship for dads to disciple their sons. But I do think it comes with some extra potency because of the relationship in which that that is happening. This really stood out to me, and it uh, I'm still trying to process exactly what it means in my own life. But why should we think of our own father as a boy looking for love? I um, mean, because so many men basically are, <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're chronologically men, but in many ways, uh, unformed, half finished and still dealing with wounds below the surface that time has covered up, but definitely has not healed. And I think this should do two things. It should put the fear of God in us. And it should also create a sense of mercy in us. It should help us. It should humanize our fathers. It should let us see them as people and realize that they have struggled to get their lives together. So I think it will give us mercy. It will help us honor their efforts, even knowing what it is that they've overcome. But it should also help us as we begin to have our own sons realize, like, we got to get our house in order. We got to get our stuff together because if we don't consciously work on turning these things from wounds into scars, we will more than likely wound our kids in the same way or use our kids for our own justification or to to deal with our own angst. This is definitely something we see in New York, and I'm sure it's actually true everywhere. It's parents trying to relive their lives and get it right through their kids uh, rather than letting their kids be who God's called them to be. They put that pressure on them to get another shot. So we need that healing. It's an important part. And not a lot of folks, people talk about the roles that men are supposed to play quite often, but we really talk about men's hearts, their need for healing, dealing with their brokenness, dealing with the epidemic of loneliness and sadness that's often there. So it's important stuff. And I, I think being a dad is is actually a gift because this the the thought of projecting this into the life of your kid it's like a mirror that you you only get once or twice in life where you realize i've got to really bring this to god i've got to lay my heart before him i've got to grow in this so it is definitely a challenge i wonder if it's becoming more of a challenge john because of the way that trauma narratives have become so central to our identities And so there's a sense in which we're almost trapped in that trauma or almost not even imagining that we can escape it because we lack the resilience to overcome it. Do you see that as a potential challenge for people picking up your book to to see, like when you talk about the generational sin, I think that's a great call to Christian discipleship and resilience and a trust in a sovereign God to say, and I think about this a lot, I think about certain sins where I say, this stops here. Um, and I look at other sins and I say, oh man, I'm, I'm still perpetuating that. I got to repent. I need the Lord. I need the Spirit's help in this one. But, uh, but how might that kind of centering of trauma and that, that overwhelming, in many ways, a self-diagnosis of having been trapped, I think maybe the flip side to that is another uh, thing I've been reading lately, which is about how many young people now are cutting off relationship with their parents. Because of a sense of, you know, I, I can't be around your toxic stuff. And I'm not talking here physical abuse, sexual abuse, things like that. I'm just sort of talking about some of the more run-of-the-mill challenges that we have as we mature. I know that's kind of a complicated question, but how might some uh, changing understandings of trauma perhaps affect how people implement that advice from your book? Well, human beings, are, are br- God has made us to be breathtakingly resilient by nature. And human beings uh, are actually quite good at dealing with trauma 
if we have the right relationships and mechanisms in place. So trauma comes to us. And if we acknowledge it and, and, and get healing, our capacity to move beyond trauma is quite breathtaking. That's a gift of God and how he's wired us. I, I think the emphasis on trauma is because so much of it was overlooked. Oh, and yeah. So it's being... It's a it's correction. Been, it's a yeah, correction. it's being brought yeah. into the light because there's a right. lot of things that were just stuffed away that did a tremendous amount of harm for people. Um, but I, I do believe um, that we have to... Yeah, we have to confront it and it's often a visceral process. And again, men are often, you know, like not as comfortable with emotions. And even Christian communities are not are not comfortable with with aggressive emotions or just that level of pain, anger, vulnerability. We tend to just have a veneer of niceness. So yeah, getting it out can be painful and it can be real. But I actually see it as an opportunity. You know, people talking about the trauma they've been through is also an opportunity to lean into healing, to be honest with the pain that they've had. And I think that uh, getting breakthroughs around this stuff can help break generational cycles. As far as kids wanting to sort of separate from their parents, I mean, that that is the classic age of authenticity. You know, it's like I'm going to self-actualize and anybody who disagrees with me is a threat to be removed you know, not a word of wisdom or insight or anything else. So that is that is definitely generational. I think it's a tragedy that there are not love bonds, sufficient love bonds and family uh, dynamics that can stay together in spite of disagreement. And I think that's an indictment on the church's failure to love. And um, if gosh, if a, if a family can't have a disagreement about politics or, you know, or, or cultural issues, and I'm not talking obviously very, very ungodly ones, but ones that Christians, you know, can fit within their paradigm. That's speaking to a deeper issue that we have to work on. And and I will say this, you know, I, I've had quite a bit of pushback on the book saying it's too intense. You know, it's like, well, this is unrealistic. And I'm, well, I simply answer, well, what's realistic American culture done for us? <laughs> what's, what, what's realistic evangelical church done for us? You know, we've come out of a 20-year experiment with men's ministries, and I look around and I'm, I see such little fruit. It's not a critique of them. It's about the, it's about the strength of the need. I, I remember going uh, to a Promise Keepers rally, and I just think this was stadiums of fathers pro- making promises. And I look around the world today, and I say, where is the fruit from that? Again, I'm not bashing those ministries as such as highlighting the challenge and the need to have an intensity around this. So hopefully this does serve as some sort of, as the generation is crying about their pain, hopefully this will be a force of healing and, and, and you know, can maybe start even in small ways some different generational cycles of blessing rather than simply passing on the brokenness. I wonder, John, if it might be helpful for the listeners to know, if I'm understanding you correctly, a lot of your analysis here of what it takes for both the church and families to do depends on a read of the culture in thick terms as opposed to thin terms, meaning that it seems as though you're recognizing that some of the conditions of modernity are a deeper problem in more basic elemental ways to Christianity than probably a lot of Christians have realized. Am I right on that kind of read? Yes, you're absolutely, you're right on two levels. Number one, there's a bunch of things happening sociologically that we're experimenting with the families in ways that no society has really, really done at scale like we are. And I think some of our reactions to that have been very, very unsophisticated and underdeveloped. I think that's definitely true. And I think we've let some of the big, larger cultural issues, which we may push back on, stop us from really examining the smaller cultural issues, which are actually robbing us uh, of the things that we're a part of. So the traditional family home, I mean, I, I grew up when I was little, we would do like a family devotion. You know, we had a family altar, that sort of thing. I mean, that that's a very, very rare thing today in a typical evangelical house to have parents who are consciously cultivating a place where God is honored and the scriptures are read. And I think it is definitely a real challenge and we've got to discern the forces that are sabotaging our best efforts. I think hopefully reading this book will give some dad some both inspiration about how people have got it right in other times of history and then some warnings about the consequences of not waking up and not paying attention to some of these things. Your book is full of so many helpful suggestions. You root them in biblical and theological reflections, but they also come from your experience. And I can understand why some people think of them as being intense. At the same time, I agree with you, we're going to have to push back. (laughs) We can't just assume that we can depend on cultural institutions to be able to accomplish these things, especially when many of them are are certainly working at cross purposes. But um, I mean, I, I just found the book to be 
basically helpful in that way at a time when there's very little there's very little formation in those ways. And so you you describe, I mean, a, a basic thing in here that I kind of thought, huh, you can't take this for granted. You describe in there how you helped your son transition from seeing your wife, his mother, as the central figure in his life to you. Just describe what your your thought process was in that and when, what that looked like. Yes, that's the most controversial part of the book, period. And it always is. And uh, everybody talks about it. My, my son and my wife, my son's uh, almost 22 uh, now. Uh, so that this happened almost 10 years ago. My son uh, has a wonderful relationship with my wife. And she was obviously very involved in his teenage years and all the rest of it. But there was some, there was some kind of instinct. And this was basically just studying sociology and history. But there's something about a young man's energy where uh, when he's – and he's, he's got chemicals pumping through his, bo- bo- uh, his body, his social dynamics are changing. There's a lot of confusing things happening in a young man's life, as, as you'll remember and as many of the listeners will be aware of. And so I wanted to, to consciously say to him, hey, you're going to be handed over or brought into a rich community of men. They're going to help you make sense of these very confusing energies. And part of the the goal of maturing means that you have to learn to embrace difficulty and you have to put away childish things, as the Apostle Paul said. And so I knew that my wife and many mother's instincts uh, can tend to be very, very nurturing. And so I was like, if if he only, if I pushed him and then all he did was went back to his mum for comfort. He would never learn to develop within him since that sense of strength or resilience. And so it was basically a dinner designed for uh, my wife to bless him and to basically say, hey, I'm, I'm focusing your attention to your father and a community of men to help you grow, and grow, grow into a man. And he will be directing the majority of your formation in the coming years. And uh, I was hard on my wife and uh, she's, that that particular night but when i was walking across spain with my son we did the camino de santiago which is a 500 mile hike just a sort of debrief he did a gap year and a lot of times there's sloppy processing on the back end and they can get disillusioned so i said let's just go i don't know walk for a month and talk about these things and i said to him hey nate uh, getting quite a bit of pushback on that dinner and he said he, sc- he stopped and he said, no, you, you, you must include that. Like, I cannot tell you how important that was for me psychologically to understand that I was entering into a different part of my life and journey. And so that's just the, the proof of one 13-year-old kid uh, processing it. But he was visceral. He's like, you cannot take that out no matter how much people push back. There's something powerful about being your, your dad stepping in and saying, let me, let me show you how to live as a man. There's something powerful about that happening. And um, I think almost all societies have done it except ours. Well, one of the difficulties, it, it seems, is that when you're dealing with the wisdom of the ages, you might look at something like this and think, every generation before us knew this had to happen. What, what have we lost? But of course, there are certain things that every generation took for granted that were bad. And so that is a very difficult situation for all of us to be in to try to figure out how to sort that through. And I have a a natural conservative bent to say that I'll aggregate the wisdom of the ages and take my chances. But because the conditions have changed so much, it it feels like everything is, is up for grabs. And one of the things that happened when my son was born is I just had a lot of conversations with my wife about about being parents of, of having a son thinking about our own own history and I know the, these are stereotypes that are stereotypes for a reason but thinking about how you have a girl uh, the, the wife has a girl and you kind of expect we're gonna have a bumpy ride there probably through the teenage years but hopefully we'll come back and we'll be friends again one day but the interesting thing about boys with their mothers is that there's a sense in which they're closest at the very beginning and it's a and it's a move away forever from there. You know, like I mean the intimacy of the womb, the intimacy of nursing, of of diapers, of changing all sorts of stuff, but but then you, you you move away and like you said the the father takes a much larger role into things of being able to show what does it mean to grow up and to and to use this strength in godly ways to care for others, to protect others. And then, of course, it seems that if, if that son grows up and gets married, it seems that sometimes that, that wife is a difficult dynamic for the mother <laughs> in many cases. And so it just seems that these are natural things that just happen. 
And yet, for some reason, they're very difficult to talk about. I find a podcast is easier to talk about them. And I appreciate you taking a chance on the book because it's precisely that it's precisely when you share something that sort of strikes us as, huh, is that really true? Actually makes us think about what we take for granted in our cultural formation. My case for why I'm glad you included that in well, there. Thanks, Mike. Yes. <laughs> well, a common theme in both books is risk. It's a, it's a big theme in your ministry. And how did you learn to embrace risk? Because we do live, especially, I think, in a increasingly risk-averse society. And um, so how did you learn to embrace risk? And I guess, how do you know when you've taken it too far? Well, it's interesting. I don't think anybody has ever said to me before that risk is a theme of my writing in ministry. I mean, it definitely is. It's one of my uh, core values. I think part of it, honestly, might be sort of the Australian spirit. I wondered about up. that. <laughs> I wondered yes, about that. I mean, well, I mean, you know, the, the Aussies, like, you know, have a go. What's the worst that could happen? There's definitely something in me yeah. like that. I dropped out of high school when I was 16 uh, to do an apprenticeship in a butcher shop. I never finished high school. And it wasn't because I was lazy. It was like, let me take a risk. I think I can I think I can get into business at 16 and make more money than my friends can at 25. It was like a calculated risk. And you know, moving to America was a risk. After I finished that uh, apprenticeship, I just sort of packed everything up. And then moving moving to New York to start a church was a risk. I, so I don't I don't want to project that onto other people. I think part of it's Australian culture. Uh, my number one spiritual gift is the gift of faith, uh, just the capacity to believe God who He is. I, I I live with a very maybe this would be a distinctive. I live with a very very profound sense of awareness of being in a covenant with God. So I mean everybody knows that our relationship with God is covenantal, but it's it's so real to me. And so I think lots of times I'm relying on the boundaries of that covenant and those covenant promises. So I'm navigating my risk in light of being in it with God, not recklessly leaping saying, God, you're going to have to bless it or human ambition. It's, it's that deep sense of, I was meditating this morning in Joshua, you know, be strong and very courageous. Uh, do not be fearful. And I was like, this is Joshua who's seen the glory. He's seen the power. He's seen the miracles of God. And yet when God tells him to step into his destiny, he still has to remind him not to be scared. And that is that is covenantal commands. I'm with you. The Lord your God is with you. I don't know, man. That I've been haunted by that covenantal understanding of my faith from my very, very early days. And it just produces like a godly confidence. I think I also have an awareness of eternity where I'm like, I realize how short life is. Like I, I, people who know me, like who know me closely say, John is haunted by an awareness of time. I'm probably the most time conscious person I know that I'm around. And um, so I'm like, let's go for it. We have eternity to, to, to have our eternal Sabbath rest. So I don't know, personality, call of God, spiritual gifting, theological uh, frameworks, psychology of time. I don't know. There's a lot in there that, I mean, honestly, you put it back down. I mean, not not in a decree sense uh, or in an outcome sense, but Jesus' whole life was risk. You know what I mean? I mean, he's willing to make bold choices and step out. The cross is the, the willingness to to say yes to the Father as well. I mean, there's there's a lot in Jesus' life that is reminding us that we should be moving forward in faith and not shrinking back in fear. So I, I don't know. I don't know if that's helpful, but that's, oh, that's extremely, where it sort of comes from. Yeah. It's extremely helpful. I don't know that I would describe myself necessarily in the risk category, but but I think people would say that I'm very intentional. And my wife would say that very intentional, and that's why I mean, the title title fits your book. It, it it describes it so well: the intentional father, a practical guide to raise sons of courage and character. And I think there's going to be a spectrum of people on risk. There's going to be a spectrum for fathers on intentionality. Uh, but one thing I want to leave people here encouraged with is to say that you know, the book is full of so much good practical advice. Some of it will stretch you. Some of it you may not take. But I want to say that. It doesn't take that much to truly be intentional and to push back. If all you do is have that family altar, of course, that you described there, John, and you take your kids to church, 
you've already done more than just about any other evangelical <laughs> to do these days. It's so, I remember Andy Crouch saying, you want to live a radical life, give 10% of your money and don't watch TV and you'll be yeah. unlike anyone you exactly. know. And I was like, yeah. that's so true. <laughs> that, that's, what I, that's what I mean. You, you, you start early on giving 10%, you don't watch TV, you read books, you, you, you have friends over, you take your kids to church and you read the Bible and sing and pray together every night. I mean, that'll do it. That's I a mean, family again, revolution right there. Yes. Right, exactly. It's not it's not it's no guarantee like you gave the important caveat, but like if you just do what are basics, you will be so you'll be so countercultural, but you will also be so it's, it, you'll be contented. I mean, it's it's a happy thing also. I kind of feel like I want to sell it. Um and, and that's yeah, it's just one reason why I just I love the book. Well, you, 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 I mean, you've written about uh, revivals and moves of God. Um, this is one of the great passions of my life. I went over to the Hebrides and um, went and talked with the folks who experienced that, that revival. And one of the things that was so fascinating to me, reaffirming what, uh, reaffirming what you're saying, the amount of people who said the religion of my childhood came back to me in power when the Holy Spirit came is extraordinary. And we are, even if we don't, see any fruit in the moment by having intentionality with our kids around faith. We are sowing the seeds in their lives for a future harvest. And I know there's a lot of kids who walk away from their faith, but honestly, statistically, the majority of those people weren't kids walking away with a level of intentionality that you and I are talking about. No, absolutely. And and I, I think there's so much power in just doing what you can, not what you can't doing it with faith, believing that God will breathe on it, even even if not right now, later. And uh, that's a good word. I mean, I wish I had some more kids to re-raise. You've all inspired me. <laughs> I think sometimes people see the exceptions, and they think that that's the rule. They see high-profile pastors, kids, things like that, turn away from the faith, deconstruct, and they think, oh, what is what difference does it make? Well, I'm not trying to you know squelch the Holy Spirit here, but if you just look at the statistics— Lyman Stone, others point this out. You do three, I think it's like three intentional things each week, family worship, worship in a congregation. You do those as a family. The likelihood of your children walking with the Lord is almost, I mean, it's almost one-to-one. It almost always happens. It's very rare that they won't do that. When you think about the way you shape the way they, you shape their view of the world, that you, you shape their expectations, their hopes, their dreams, their fears, and you you instill this catechetical mindset not only in just behaviors but also in beliefs, and yeah, it it may go away for a while, but it never quite leaves you. You combine that with a an atmosphere of love, man, that is just. I want to I want to encourage parents in that, and I think they'll find your book to be a very instructive guide in that. So, John, I want to hit a final three with you. Okay, so we'll do quick quick style on these. How do you find calm in the storm? Uh, I get up early, I drink coffee, and I do three kinds of reading. I read the scriptures, I read theology, and I read a devotional book for my heart. And if I get that time in the morning, the level of joy and gratitude is very, very high. So just abiding is how I'd summarize it. Love it. Where do you find good news today? Uh, from talking with leaders in my church. Mm. You know, New York is is very anti-Christian at a meta level, but people are desperate at a personal level. Yeah. And the amount of people whose hearts are open, meeting Jesus, it's it's very exciting. So I get a lot of joy there. That's cool. And what's the last great book you've read? The last great book uh, I read was a book called The Deeper Journey by Robert Mulholland Jr. And it was a book on the false self. And it's basically an exposition of Colossians about um, putting to death our old man and what it means to have our lives hidden with Christ in God. Actually, it's a little bit similar to sort of like a counterfeit God's book, diagnosis of idols and our false selves. But I got I got done reading that book and I just remember thinking, this is the solution to every one of my exhausted, non-believing friends trying to invent an identity and prove their way in the world. I mean, just it was a beautiful book. Perfect. My guest on Gospel Bound this week, John Tyson. You can pick up his book, The Intentional Father, A Practical Guide to Raise Sons of Courage and Character, published by Baker. That was focus of our conversation, but you can also check out his 2020 book, Beautiful Resistance, The Joy of Conviction in a Culture of Compromise, published by Multnomah. John, it's been wonderful. Thank you. No worries. It's been great. Thanks. 
Thanks for listening to this episode of Gospel Bound. For more interviews and to sign up for my newsletter, head over to tgc.org slash gospelbound. Rate and review Gospel Bound on your favorite podcast platform so others can join the conversation. Until next time, remember, when we're bound to the gospel, we abound in hope. Thank you.